Midnight Masterminds. Uh, we have some uh, bitter, sad news to start off with right off the bat. Tyler did let us know that he's no longer going to be a part of Midnight Masterminds. Oh, wait. Sorry, I just dreamt that. My bad. Um, oh, wait, what? <laughs> I slept like a baby last night. Anyway. Hey, <laughs> Just kidding. My name is Wyatt. I'm Tyler. <laughs> and I'm Katie May. NASA May. Or in a NASA shirt. So we're changing up the order here, and Katie May and Tyler are sitting over there, and they're thinking, uh, how come I didn't know about that? Well, you do now. I never know how these episodes are going to go. We're just telling, I, I'm just telling you when to speak and what to say. Do you not want me on you, the podcast do you, anymore? <laughs> do you have your scripts? All right, good. Read it exactly as I wrote them. No, but do you not want me on the What are you talking about? On the show anymore. Why would you think that? We enter a dark room. Dark room. <laughs> Dim lighting. I just, like, you could just say it if you don't, and I won't bother you guys. What are you talking about? Uh-huh. I think you would still no, that was it. just a dream. A great dream. Anyway, <laughs> all right. Uh, we're actually going to do our reviews up top, and then we're going to do all the shenanigans afterwards in the back end. Oh. In the back burner. So if anyone is tuning in just to get the reviews, to get the bull crap out of the way, well, here it is. You're welcome. We're going to start with... The Predator. Oh, okay. Where Tyler's like, what? wait a minute. Uh, I want to pass the ball over to Tyler. He's going to talk a little bit about The Predator. We just saw it. We're fresh. Mm-hmm. We're fresh off fresh The Predator. Fresh as a daisy. I didn't see it. What? Fresh as a daisy? Yeah. Are daisies notorious for being fresh? I don't know. I <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> rewatched American Horror Season 1, American Horror Story Season 1, because the new season just started, and it is supposed to be a combination of Murder House and Coven, so that's what I did. That's wow. great, and completely unrelated to what we were talking <laughs> what about, a, What a Thank great you. segue Well, I wanted to, to say why I didn't go see the Predator, because I didn't want to. I'm glad that you brought all that up. Anyway, so go, Tyler, when hurry, we, before we go somewhere else. Where should I start? <laughs> it was directed by Jan Damanji. I think that's how you pronounce his name. The or Predator? Name. Yeah. You mean Shane Black, right? That's what I said. <laughs> What? You have Jan Damanji in on there. No, like the coffee paste thing was weird, so all the predator stuff ended up underneath the white boy Rick page. No, look at no. No, look I'm at, reading it too. <laughs> you see, <I'm> like, <laughs> it's okay. Uh, um, just know that that's not true. It's directed by Shane Black. Yeah, it's directed by written and directed by Mr. Shane Black. Yep. He got in trouble because he hired a sex offender friend of his. Yeah, let's not talk too much about that because it is what it is. It was stupid yeah. and makes me like Shane Black less. A lot less. But anyway. But that's um, life. We're here now. This is an action movie. Predator crash lands on the planet Earth and he's running away from a bigger, scarier predator. And Boyd Holbrook, or as Wyatt and I know him, that really charismatic bad guy with the cybernetic arm from Logan. Yes, um, that guy. Leads a ragtag group of well, loonies, as they call themselves. We're they're, the loonies. They're soldiers that are in, that are being discharged or in prison or whatever. They were about to be lobotomized. Well, that was sort of that was what Holdbrook was going to go through. The rest of them were just in jail they're for being in a therapy group. Is yeah, what they call it. room two. Yep, the room two loonies. Yep, 
Um, and they basically fight. They fight. A, a, they fight a predator, and then they fight a bigger predator. And they have. They get a little predator dog along the way. Yeah, and it's real cute. It's adorable. When I say cute. I mean disgusting. Yeah, yeah. It was cool. horrible to look at. But anyway, uh, I thought it was fun. Like, um, all the reviews are saying it's real bad. Yeah, this movie was getting kind of dragged through the mud, and I kind of get it. Oh, I get it too. I kind of I get what they're saying, and I don't disagree with them. But I also had fun in the movie. Agreed. I, w- I like it when movies get dragged in the mud like this because sometimes that lowers your expectations tremendously. So when you get something that's passable, it, it if somehow appears to be even better. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Maybe I mean, I'm probably never going to watch it again. No, I, I don't have the desire to see it again. No. But I don't feel like I wasted my time like I did with uh, Mile uh, 20. Shut up! Or don't Slender bring Man. that in here! <laughs> Well, because we went to see those with the same hope in our head that we would have fun watching them. Yeah, we did not. Well, that so that we finally came back and now it, like we're having fun watching yeah. a crappy. This wasn't even really a crappy movie, if you ask me. Mm. So. And who's asking you? Tyler is. Why? What did you think? <laughs> um, I think the characters are at the same time like the lifeboat that keeps this whole movie afloat, and then somewhere in the middle they become an anchor and makes it a worse movie. Mm. Um. I think there's a little bit too much CGI overexposure, but it's kind of forgivable. Uh, the movie walks a really weird line of being really close to a PG-13 movie, but it's too PG-13 CGI action needs to be considered a hard art, like mm-hmm. a hard horror movie. Mm-hmm. But it's also, or too gory rather, to be considered that. But it's also too CGI and too actiony to be considered a horror movie. So it's really weird. Like it's mm. not hard R horror enough for people to be like, yeah, I go for the the guts and the brains and all that. There's but, a lot of violence. But it's not PG thirteen, so your thirteen year old action hero kids who want to see that kind of movie also can't go see it. So it's in a really weird place. Yeah. Um, it's really just made for I don't know, like the eighteen to twenty two year old who mm. I don't know loves action movies, but now you can see the ones with blood in them, so it's cool. I yeah. guess. Um, the reason I brought up the characters is that they set up a lot of character things, uh, and then nobody changes or there goes through really any kind of arc at all, and it's kind of weird. They set up things like the main character having a divorced marriage, and when they go back to the house, when they go back to the house, uh, he brings all the loonies with him, she goes, he's a bad husband, but a good soldier, and you think that that somehow is going to play into his character arc, you're going to figure out... Why was he a bad husband in the first place? Is he going to grow from this experience? No, it just doesn't at all. It ignores all that stuff. Uh, so it's kind of weird. You, you, the reason that I, I say that it at first is keeping it afloat is all the character stuff is really interesting. When the characters interact with each other, it's hilarious. It's great. Shane Black is really, really good at dialogue. It's fun. And then all of a sudden, he decided to stop being fun mm-hmm. and just focus on the Predator stuff, which is fine. But... None of the stuff that he decided to set up in the beginning of the movie had any payoff. Mm-hmm. So you just kind of feel like you wasted your time getting to know all these people because all he wanted to do was get to the blow-up stuff. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. It's fun, though. If you go in not expecting anything like the first Predator or any yeah. other... It's not like any other Predator movie. No, not at all. A lot of people said that, oh, this movie it's feels really- like it belongs in the Predator franchise. Like a, I don't turn to his roots. I'm like, I disagree hey. completely. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I don't think it does. It felt like Power Rangers versus the Predator, <laughs> a little bit. Um, no, it, because like everyone had a we- every one of the main characters had a like weird, a weird. Tw- oh yeah, like the court. new weird Power Ranger movie. Yeah, where everyone is kind of a dick. Yeah, it was fun. Thomas Jane. <laughs> Thomas Jane had Tourette's. And was re- said he wanted to eat out Olivia Munn real quick. Yeah. It, it, Got away with it because he has Tourette's. It was really awkward, actually. It was weird. <laughs> it was really bad. Some of the jokes were really weird. Yeah. I don't know, man. It's an alright movie. I don't hate it, but also, yeah, probably never going to see it again. Yeah. I, it's the only thing I want to point out, and I think I've said it before, maybe when we watched Slender Man. Mm-hmm. I don't know, because I don't even know if there was any blood in Slender Man. No. Just, I don't know, when I'm watching something that's supposed to be horror, mm-hmm. and I see CGI blood, it's mm-hmm. always really obviously CGI blood, yep. and it takes me right out of it. And the fact that the first Predator, and this is in the trailer, so I'm not spoiling anything. And the first Predator that shows up is in, like, a like a prosthetic suit. Yeah. So it looks really badass. Yes. Just, like, standing next to the, I don't know, 15-foot tall CGI Predator. Mega Predator. Makes it totally uncool. I don't know what it is. Like, you see 
really cool badass predator in the suit and it's all practical and you're like yeah dude we're getting a real yeah, raw nitty gritty predator got, movie when he got killed yeah and then he gets killed by the taller predator and then it's just a, a, being attacked by a CGI monster the whole time it's like oh man that's a bummer plot point question so the movie ends with uh, Boyd Holbrook's character and his son who has Asperger's and is really smart yeah um, in a weird underground science facility yeah about to open the pod, which was the like MacGuffin for the predators in this movie. Yeah, they're all like tr- one predator is trying to plant it on Earth because they want to save humanity from predators coming to inhabit their planet in the future. So they call it the Predator Killer, mm-hmm. and the other predator wants to blow it up because I want to inhabit the planet Earth. Mm-hmm. And it's like this. It's like you said. It's a. It's like a Iron Man predator suit. Yeah, that's purpose built to take out predators. Look terrible, by the way. The CGI for that thing was awful. Yeah. But why did a predator want to give humans the ability to slaughter predators? Well, the only explanation that we get at one point is the 15-foot-tall predator calls the other predator a traitor. Mm-hmm. Why did he... Why did he commit treason? I don't know. Maybe... It's not really clear why... The maybe other there's a subcast predator. of predators that don't want to kill anymore. They just want to do haberdashery. I don't know. Yeah, well, that's true, but the other predator... The one that was trying to save humanity still slaughtered a whole lab full of technicians. Exactly. Yeah, it's really yeah. So that rat predator was believed to be one who was trying to save humanity. Yet he goes around just murdering anybody. The only person that he spared, which never came up again. This is why I talk about character stuff not being fulfilled in this movie. Olivia Munn is just sitting in a corner, and the predator has her dead to rights. Mm-hmm. He, he could really have just like eaten mm-hmm. her fucking face off right then mm-hmm. and just walked away. And I thought, oh, is there something special about her? Is it her DNA? Does she have a purpose that the Predator doesn't need to exploit yet? Yeah. None of that mattered, though. I think, classically, Predators don't fuck with people who aren't actively fighting them. So, like, maybe that maybe he would he only killed the soldiers and wasn't actually trying to kill doctors, but they got hurt anyway. No, he was intentionally... But, but he in, walked yeah. up to a lab technician who was just scared on the table uh-huh. and slapped his face off. No, that was a soldier. Are you sure? Um, yeah. I mean, he killed soldier. almost every single lab tech in there, except for one dude. Who looked like T.J. Miller's weird uncle. That was creepy looking. Anyway. He was a creepy looking guy. It was a decent movie. I think... But if, all this character stuff doesn't like make any sense. No. Which is why it's weird. Yeah. If... Should you go see it, don't pay for it. <laughs> yeah. If you have AMC, A-List, or movie pass, you know, movie pass perfect still Perfect opportunity to kill a Friday night that you're Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. Otherwise, yep, you, you don't really need it. Yeah, it's all right. So it's we're right. not buying the steel book for. Oh it. heck no! Nah. I don't even know. If they, will they even release a steel book for this? I don't know. Well, maybe if it, it makes enough a steel money. Steel book for everything. So okay. Yeah, I just I don't think this movie deserves all the hate that it's getting. They call agree. It, all of the like all the reviews are saying it's a mess and the structures all over the place. I don't I don't want to I don't think that at all. I just think that a lot of character choices were just really weird. Mm-hmm. For example, Olivia Munn. You don't get to learn anything about her except she's a doctor who wrote the book on biological evolution, which I don't think she's near old enough to do that. That or <laughs> ever the, displayed to be smart enough. Right. She never really gives us an op- We don't get an opportunity to learn anything about her. And then as soon, as soon as shit goes down, she can handle weapons like she's been in the military for 15 years. She jumps and She, she jumps jump from a rooftop of, onto a moving bus. With with ease. She hurricane ranas a giant, the giant predator by the end of the movie. Yeah, and which, jumps on top of him and tries to like stab his fucking eyes out. Yeah. It, so why is she... It's cool that she's so badass, but... Why? At, at least the the main character, we, we know all everything there is to know about him. Yes. And why he can do what he does. He was pretty she, good. Yeah, he was great. But she's keeping up with him. Yeah. And he's one of the most decorated, uh, in the movie, one of yeah. the most decorated like snipers that work for the fucking military. Ever. Why Why is she able to keep up with him so easily? Yeah. It makes no sense. It's really yeah. weird. Yeah. I don't know, man. Anyway, let's move on to White Boy Richard. I haven't seen it. It's pretty good. Okay. All right, Katie May, take it away. What is the story of White Boy Richard? Detroit. Yeah, point so far. And his dad sells guns. And looks just like Matthew McConaughey. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> and he ends up getting in with the FBI and has to sell drugs for the FBI so yes. they can take down the bad drug dealers of the neighborhood in yes. Detroit. And then 
he has a baby and he goes to jail and he has been in jail since what like 1987 I think it was yeah and he just got released like this year he's not released yet not yet he's getting out this year for sure yeah because it's all based on true story it is it is and even though it's only what Maybe two hours long. Mm-hmm. It feels like the longest movie you've somehow. ever seen. I don't even understand it. Like we got out of there, and I thought it was eleven o'clock. It was only nine thirty. <laughs> so I think <laughs> I agree with everything you said. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you guys were with me every time I saw this trailer, and what did I say every single time? There's no way the movie is, is going to be this good. Yeah, it's this impossible fast. to make a movie based on true events as good as that trailer was telling us it was going to be. I think that this movie should have, actually, they should have looked at the trailer and were like, oh man, we're kind of overselling this shit a little bit, why don't we tone it down? Because here's the thing about this movie, it's not bad at all. It's not. It's just oversold. So we go in thinking like, we're going to see a movie that matches the energy and the speed and the tone and the awesomeness of that trailer. That's such a badass trailer. Yeah, it's pretty good. What the hell is so good? And we're I going just, for custard. Yeah. That's still a really good part of the movie. That's funny. So, <laughs> custard. The thing about this this movie that makes it interesting is that the characters are so definitively drawn. Mm-hmm. If this movie's not good at very many things, it's really, really, really good at characters. Like you, you totally understand who each person is, what their motivations are. They each have a little bit of a growth that they go through. It's so interesting to watch. Uh, but I mean, it, Katie may hit all the major points right on the head. Uh, White boy Rick is he's trying to keep his dad out of jail so the FBI they approach him say hey well we won't arrest your dad for running drugs or not drugs running guns if you do a couple buys for us and we know who's dealing drugs in town and if you do a couple other things for us as in sell some some uh, drugs so that we can figure out who's buying all that kind of stuff so he was an informant at 14 15 years old because the FBI was basically telling him what to do you really get the idea, too, that these are kind of dirty FBI agents, but that's never really spelled out for you. But because of what he learned in the very short amount of time that he was working with the FBI as a 15-year-old, he decided, you know, I know how to do this really well now, and all the people here know me, and the big kingpin in town just got taken down. Because of the work he did, I could actually make a lot of money for myself, yeah. and he did, which was really cool. He That was a perfect opportunity for him to do that mm-hmm. except the fucking FBI knows everything about you you dumb motherfucker mm-hmm. yeah why would you <laughs> I'm sorry the FBI knows everything about you why are you doing that yeah <laughs> why and Nancy bought one sisters in the movie too yes she was, it was really good I really liked her yeah so this movie honestly I liked it a lot but it suffers to me from war dog syndrome it's yeah. almost like the same situation where it's based on a true story, there's a blazing hot like pace, and then just screeches to a halt at one point. When when Rick has his son or daughter, rather, sorry, when when he has his baby, it immediately just turns into something else, and you're really unprepared for it. Up until then, you're like, man, where's this gonna go? Where's this gonna go? This has to have some really awesome ending. Where's the crescendo? There's never with these kind of movies a crescendo. It's not. It, it just, and it's not to their fault, really. They're trying to tell. Story. A really good story. They're trying to tell the story the right way. I mean, you you appreciate that, but we need to stop picking movies that have an excellent setup with no fucking ending. Like War Dogs. What happens at the end of that movie, Tyler? They go to jail. What do you think happens at the end of this movie? Yeah, he goes. He goes to jail. He, in, he's still in jail. So once he goes and to jail, what can what can happen? Maybe we should start doing like loosely based on a true story mm. and then make our own endings to make it exciting. Yeah, I don't know. And isn't that the point of movies? Yeah, I mean, it's this one they're trying to tell the story and tell it right, so I, I, I do take points away for that. Or, sorry, I give it more points where I normally would take it away for a crappy ending. There are a lot of like real-life stories that are awesome while they're happening, but yeah, they just kind of have a normal real-life ending. Yeah. Like, there's in, in the movie version of this, he doesn't go to jail. He gets a one up on the on the FBI and sends them to jail and stays an informant or something. Maybe you should ask the guy who went through it how he thinks the ending should go, how he wanted it to go. I down. watched that movie. They should release two versions of the movie, one that ends in a way that I like, <laughs> and one that is the real version. Uh, but just ask the guy like if if it went your way, like where would you have seen you? 
yourself. Like, yeah. you didn't get caught. Yeah. That'd I think be that'd interesting. be interesting because then it's like, oh, what? I would have blown up. I would have done this and done yeah. that. You know what's funny is is because I talked about how well the characters are drawn. At, at one point, so Matthew McConaughey, his dad, his big ambition is to own a video store so him and his family can be self-sufficient and stop being so poor all the time and he doesn't have to keep running guns illegally because that's mm -hmm. the only thing he knows how to do. And he finally gets the gun store. Like, uh, the video white, store. For the video yeah. store, yeah. White Boy Rick gets enough money through running drugs as a kingpin to be able to do it. So what if he just and, stopped selling drugs? Well, yeah, so his dad even store. told him. He was about, that's, that was probably the most interesting part of the movie is you can tell that Rick is sort of like living it up and his dad goes, hey, he stops him. He says, let's not get greedy. We got what we want. We got exactly what we need. Mm -hmm. Let's let's quit while we're ahead. And he goes, okay, yeah. And you, you get the idea that he was going to and then the next day, literally the next day, the cops bust into the house and take him to jail. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right when he had everything that he wanted. Um, I think maybe we just saw too much after that. Like, you could have ended the movie right there. Because mm -hmm. we know how it ends. Yeah. But then we spend about, like, 30 minutes of, like, him in jail and going through all that nonsense, and you just think... Yeah, like, I don't need a scene of white boy Rick eating a meal alone in jail. <laughs> yeah. Um, but some interesting uh, tidbits about the movie, though, moving on to, like, more facts about it. Uh, the guy who plays white boy Rick, his name is Richie Merritt. Mm -hmm. uh, he was and very good. He was, he was good. And he, he was kind of... He was he is in, like at that time was a nobody, and someone spotted him in Baltimore, Maryland, and was like, "Holy crap, that kid looks so much like White Boy Rick." Let's see if he can read, and uh, that just looking the way he looks. Let's see if he can read. Like read lines. Oh. Okay. I'm not saying like that kid looks like an uneducated swine. Let's see if he's civilized. Well, the way you said, if you don't know, read, like, read lines, that, bro. That language is just funny. That kid looks just like my boy Rick. Let's see if he can read. He can read? <laughs> he can read words. <laughs> Write a sentence. You like give him a Harry Potter book? Can you read this to and us? And he's like, words? who's Harry Potter? <laughs> now, so, but I said, let's see if he can He's illiterate, read not mentally really handicapped. <laughs> Listen here. That was my version of him. Whoa. <laughs> that somewhere. went somewhere. No, it wasn't. It wasn't trying to go anywhere. Hey, red, red, red. People can't read, also can't speak. <laughs> Everyone knows that. That was him reading. <laughs> he can still talk, all right? Shut up. That is my story. <laughs> he was spotted, and they wanted to see if he could read, read lines. lines. And uh, he took two weeks of acting classes just to be able to go to his audition. So he went to L.A. with Matthew McConaughey hmm. to do an audition with him. And it was actually a big push from Matthew McConaughey and the director to bring him on because he's literally a nobody who only had two weeks of acting classes. And uh, the studio was like, we don't feel comfortable with this. But I guess him and Matthew McConaughey built up a really good relationship on like trust. And every time he was having an issue, McConaughey would like coach him through it. Because they felt so strongly that he he brought some not just the look but just he Sorry. brought something to the role that felt authentic, and I agree. Uh, the sad part though I feel like is that he's born to play this role, but there aren't very many other roles that he will be a really good fit for. Yeah. Just sort of the way he talks and the way he acts. I I like them a lot, and maybe he'll he'll grow from this role and do something else in the future. Could you imagine that just walking down the street and he's like, hey. You look like that guy. Want to be in a movie? Yeah, want to want to meet Matthew McConaughey and fly to L.A. Uh, okay. How old is this kid? Um, let me see. That'd be crazy. He was 15 when he was spotted. Wow, just 15 years old, just walking around. Somebody's like, "You look like that drug dealer who's in jail. You want to play him? You want to be in a movie? Want to be a movie? We're gonna make you famous, kid." Like, Okay. Can you read? Can you read? <laughs> hey, kid, can you read? What's important is that you know how to read. What but if he didn't know how to read? Do you think they still would have got? Do you think they would have taught him how to read? They would have. They would have. He would have gotten a tutor, probably. Ooh, um, they would have really wanted him in it. Uh, but this movie was directed by a guy named Jan Demange. Demange. I don't know. He's he's a Frenchie. And he's done a. He's been really busy for a long time. Um, he's done. Short films, documentary short films, he's been doing TV for a long time, but now because of this movie, he's been kind of a hot commodity, so who knows what he's going to do next. I think this movie is super well directed, if, if the character choices and all that has anything to, to go by. I just think that the script isn't that good. It's slow. <laughs> yeah. So, 
maybe if this guy gets something a little more high octane, he could really do some fun stuff with it. Because mm -hmm. his character stuff is excellent. Really, really good stuff. So, the only other movie that we reviewed this week, or are going to review for, for you fine folks, uh, wherever the heck you are, is The Nun. Dun, dun, nun. Yay. I fell asleep. Yeah, so Katie May literally fell asleep during The Nun, so then we're off to a good start. Like, I think ten minutes in, and then I woke up for the last five minutes. Nice. I would say give us a, a little plot rundown, but I don't think you could because you didn't watch the movie. <laughs> Wait, let me try. The girl from American Horror Story is a nun. You got and it, man. <laughs> the guy... What are we still doing here? The drug dealer from Weeds, the husband, comes in and is like, you need to come with me to, where is it, Romania? Romania, yes. And they're like, there's an evil here. And then uh, some spooky stuff happens, and he's buried alive, and then I uh, fell asleep. And then I woke up, and they were in water, and they were like, <laughs> and that's all I remember. Well. It's pretty good, right? Yeah, I mean, nothing you said is wrong. Uh, some, <laughs> some facts about this movie. Uh, it's directed by a gentleman named Corin Hardy. And His name is Corn. Corin. Oh. C O R I N. I thought she said Corn. His name is Corn. Hi, nice K. to meet you. I'm Corn. Oh, I'm Corn. What well, kind of Corn? Creamed? Oh, like I haven't heard that joke before. <laughs> Fuck. But anyway, uh, he's been he's been directing uh, short films and horror films for a little while. Fun fact: good friends with Edgar Wright. So. Uh oh. If that means anything. I don't know if it does. But. This, the Nun right now currently holds a 5.8 out of 10 on IMDb. Oof. A 4.1 out of 5 Metacritic rating. Okay. Makes no sense there. Uh, and then a 27% on Rotten Tomatoes. So Critic score or, or audience score? Critic score. Or what's the audience score? Uh, that's a good question. Why don't, you, why don't you pull it up there? I'm doing it. Dude. D-O-O-D. I'm Dude. doing it right now. Keep Tell talking. Tell us what it is. Okay, so here's the story of Le Nun. Uh... The Nun is basically... 46%. Okay. So, The Nun is in this cathedral, I guess you could call it, in Romania. The evil, the, the entity, which is known as Valak, if you've seen the Conjuring movies, is kept sort of in the basement. And there's even a sign that says, God ends here. Basically, don't go in this fucking room. And this, this thing has been sort of built here just to keep that evil contained mm -hmm. and it's starting to get out it's getting frustrated and angry and one nun goes in to try to investigate and that doesn't work she yeah the, why would you go in why do people go into those rooms they're like i'm gonna look at I'm it i'm gonna go see what i can do about it. you're not gonna do shit but anyway <laughs> yeah, bitch. Like, she, get goes, out of there. she thinks that she can do shit so she goes in I'm there i'm gonna pray him away now this one nun knows that if the other nun the last one there she knows that if if the if Valak can possess a human body, then it can get out. So the nun commits suicide to save the the spirit from getting out. It's still an evil spirit. It's still haunting this this like castle. Mm -hmm. But because it hasn't possessed a human, it can't like leave. Right. So all the nuns in this place are pretty much dead. The Vatican sends a, a, a like a father. I'm not sure exactly what he was. And this other nun that I still don't fully understand why uh, this nun hasn't taken her vows yet. She's very young and very new to this whole nun thing. Sends them together to go investigate. They're doing an investigation. They bring um, a guy who calls himself Frenchie along with because he's the one who found the nun who had hung herself when he was delivering goods to the, uh, the, the place, right? Basically, a whole mess of stuff happens that I don't really need to go into that just proves that, oh, yeah, this place is haunted as fuck. So they're they're trying to, you know, figure out how and why and what's going on. And there's some twists and turns along the way, and there are a lot of nuns in there, and then you find out that there were no nuns in there the whole time. It was You were being deceived into thinking it was all projections. Dude, it gets real confusing. It is pretty random, actually. So I, the reason that I think people don't like this movie is that once they get there, well, one, you already knew that all the nuns were dead. Because you saw them all die. So when you see other nuns there, you're like, where the fuck did these nuns come from? And then you find out they were all dead. It's like, well, they must have been, I guess. Or they must be projections of some kind. And no matter how much crazy, creepy shit happens, they're like, we gotta stay here. And the, the father, or you know, the, the guy, 
who's there, is probably one of the dumbest horror movie people or like victims I've ever seen in my right. life. He just yeah. Every time the the demon leads him somewhere, he gets into a real fucked up situation. But then when it happens again, and it's clearly a demon directing you, you you'd still go. Like the first time it happened was probably the worst time. He gets led into an open coffin, gets pushed inside, and then buried alive. But the demon is nice enough to give him a bell so that he can ring it, and people can be like, "Oh shit, you're buried alive." But anyway, he he gets out, and then later on in the movie when he's Clearly interacting with the demon. The demon walks into a room. He's like, I'm going to go in that room. I'm sitting there going like, what? Like, the first time is forgivable because you have no clue what's going on and you're here to, for, like, investigate. But why would you go a second time, you fucking idiot? It's because he's better as a... a drug king. A drug kingpin. But anyway, um, a lot of stuff happens that's supposed to prove to the audience that this place is haunted. Then once they finally go or decide, hey, we should probably try and take care of this, they go down below and again making no sense on how all these like so a nun tells the new nun like the younger nun who hasn't taken her vows yet mm -hmm. tells her hey there's an evil and the evil came out of this portal and if we close the portal the evil will be contained within the portal but because she was a projection literally the the demon told her how to kill the demon also it was never resolved why this young nun it's kind of like what happened in the predator like you you never get an answer as to why this young nun who hasn't taken her vows yet is the one who was selected by the Vatican out of nowhere to go on this investigation. They do that to try to tease you, like, oh, there's something special about her. They never pay it off. No, there's nothing special. It doesn't make any sense. I don't get it. Frustrating. Yeah. So, but anyway, uh, a bunch of shit goes down. They they close up the portal and all is well. They use the blood of Jesus Christ, and I'm not even joking. Like, I'm not talking a metaphorical or like it's blessed or like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, Literally, they Jesus have a vial blood. of his blood. Nice. Yeah, <laughs> so, uh, but as, as you do. So here's here's like my overall line. It's it is like the acting was really good. I did enjoy the acting, even though they were kind of working with a really weird script. Uh, the the moody sort of tone keeps you in a very constant state of dread the whole time, uh, and I think that works to the film's disadvantage because in, in movies like The Conjuring, for example, the scariest things happen when you start to let your guard down. And because this movie is consistently just, like, hitting you in the face with, like, sadness and creepy imagery, you're never comfortable, ever. And it, it made for interesting visuals, for sure, but you never let your guard down, and thus none of the jump scares really worked, if you ask me. One know. of the reviews on Rotten Tomatoes I like is says, Were it not for sudden blasts of Dolby Fury, there would be nothing to provide shocks. Yeah. Let alone scares. If they if they provided any context for you to let your guard down, then those jump scares probably would have been more impactful, I guess. Yeah. Um, like the directing and whatnot isn't bad. It's it's they tried really hard to play up the creepy imagery of it, and then actually I think played against it. Um, I I do think it does deserve the hate that it's getting, which is sad. I do want to say though, I was never bored. So it didn't commit the cardinal sin of boring me to death. I I, I had an enjoyable time. And the nun is still creepy as fuck. Uh, the only thing I will say is, like, on, to put a cherry on top of this whole thing is, this is the first movie in this whole Conjuring universe that leans a little too heavily on the movies that came before it. Uh. So I was there with uh, Kia Bash, who's our, a good friend of all of ours. Hi, Kia Bash. And every time they would show Thanks clips, for the new logo, BB. Boom. Every time that they would show clips from the Conjuring 1 and 2, he would just sit there going like, who are these people and what is going on? And even the Marvel movies don't do that. I mean, now they do, but that's like 20 movies in. You could start doing that. Yeah. Uh, here they use clips from The Conjuring uh, 2 to sort of hype up the nun at the beginning of the movie. And if you've seen it, you kind of go like, okay, it's kind of like a recap. But if you haven't, you're, you're like waiting for those people to show up in the movie. And they don't because they're not born yet. Yeah. Uh, and then, well, they are born yet, I guess. But like they're like babies. Uh -huh. And then at the end of the movie... Uh, they kind of do the same thing where they tie back into The Conjuring 1. You guys have all seen The Conjuring 1. Yes. yes. So, you know, in the beginning when they're showing... Well, not the beginning. It's more in the middle. They're showing a little projection screen like they normally do. And they say, this is so-and-so. He, you know, was uneducated and he worked as a blah, blah, blah. And then he... Um, what was it? Spoke some of the best Latin I'd ever heard in my entire life. And then a uh, cross started to protrude from underneath his skin right by his stomach. That was the Frenchie guy from this movie. 
But if you didn't see The Conjuring 1, you'd just been like, oh, so that's what happened to that guy. That's, all right, yeah, that's how he died. That's cool. But it's also the movie, The Conjuring Universe, trying to tell you how Valak got out of there. So, yeah, they contain the evil, but she did possess him and lay dormant for, like, 30 years. So, I, it's, I don't know, it's too messy. It's too... It, there's not a whole lot of story once you get to, the, like, the castle. Once you get there, you know everything you need to know already. Yeah. So it's just shit happens with no stakes. And spoops. Yeah, exactly. So, what That's a, a what a bummer. Yeah, what a bummer it is. The trailer was scary, and then that ad they did on YouTube. What ad? There was an, a YouTube ad that got removed because it was scaring too many people. <laughs> Tell me about it. So it's a, I never saw it. It's like a 15-second ad, and it would pop up, and it would look like your volume was getting turned up. And then turned all the way down, so you would be like, "What the fuck?" You would turn your volume. You would turn up. your volume all the way up, <laughs> and then the scary nun would jump scare you on the screen. That's funny. That's genius. So many people complained though, because it was blowing out their ears. Yeah. That they took the they removed the ad. Man, I want to find it. It's out. It's on the internet. Oh, I'm gonna find it after this. So don't let me forget. I won't. Anyway, uh, now that we've reviewed all these movies, does anyone have any questions or any other tidbits to add anything else before we move on to shenanigans? Um, Predator was pretty good, but we already. Yeah, we did talk about that already. That's it. What do you think, Katie? May anything else? No. Nope. Moving on to movie news, everybody. Tyler, take it away with the movie news. We're gonna save the best for last year. Okay. Um. Oh, okay. So director Todd Phillips shared an image on Instagram with the caption Arthur, and this was the first look at Joaquin Phoenix in character. As Le Joker. As the Joker. Le Joker. And I was all excited, because I read the headline before I saw the picture, and it said, Joaquin Phoenix's Joker unveiled in first look photo. And I was like, oh, that sounds exciting. And I scrolled down, and it's just a picture of Joaquin Phoenix looking old and kind of smirking. Yeah. So it's clearly a, a photo from, like, the first 20 minutes of the movie sure. before he gets joker fight. Absolutely. But what? That's the most clickbaity title ever. Yeah. And I'm sure it wasn't Todd Phillips that did that. No, not the title. But... That's fucked up. Yeah. Stop like doing the, shit if, like that. If you see the Instagram post, you're like, oh, okay, that's what Joaquin Phoenix is going to look like before he becomes a Joker. And you're fine with it. But fucking Hollywood Reporter had got us to put it in their, or put it in our movie podcast with uh, Joaquin Phoenix's Joker unveiled in the first look photo. Jerks. And I'm like, you guys. But anyway, yeah, that looks interesting. Yeah, I mean, it, it's probably going to be great. Todd Phillips is I. Right. Joaquin Phoenix is damn good. Um, I like the Joker. I hope this movie is all right. Because it's produced by Martin Scorsese. So, I didn't know that. Yeah, so oh. he's yeah he's producing it. So he's clearly going to be there making sure things go okay. But Todd Phillips, he's he's really a hit or miss director for me. In fact, he's never made a movie that I outright love. Even The Hangover, when I, I was like, like younger, I thought it was really good. Mm-hmm. And then we talked about it on this podcast yeah. when I went it does to not watch age it. Well, yeah. I was like, oh, maybe this movie isn't that great. So I don't know. I hope that it's all right. War Dogs was... The suck fest, yeah, total suck fest. So I hope that I hope this is okay. All right. Um, so yeah, I don't know how to really describe this one. So there is a movie theater called I think it's Viva, Viva Cinemas. Yeah, and they they specialize in re-releasing uh, Hollywood movies, but they're overdubbed or they have captions for people of different languages mostly Hispanic and mm-hmm. you know so they'll, they'll basically they'll dub movies in Spanish or they'll put they'll put um, subtitles on movies so that Spanish audiences can connect with them and I guess there's an AMC nearby this theater and the Viva Cinemas are they were trying to take them to court for basically putting them out of business and they believe that AMC Cinemas sp- specifically the one near them colluded with multiple movie studios to prevent them from being able to play any of their movies so that AMC could be the only ones to do it. Uh, After reading the article and sort of just getting the facts, it sounds a lot like the movie theater probably had issues being able to caption movies themselves Mm -hmm. and dub movies themselves so they weren't allowed to play any of the Marvel movies or anything like that. And they probably just pointed the finger over at AMC. Now, I'm not here to say that, oh, AMC would never do something like that. I'm sure they probably would. Oh, sure. But also, at the same time, it sounds a lot like someone is someone mismanaged their business and is pointing at AMC going, like, it's your, it's your fault. I don't know what proof they have. Um, also, I don't think that they're actually concerned about it because it's settled out. Yeah. So, who knows? If, uh, if AMC really is doing that, 
You know, fuck yourselves. It's not cool. Don't fuck with the small business. And if they're not, stop trying to mooch yeah. small business. Yeah, just mooching. But whatever. We all right. settled out. So that's all the, the weird news. Let's get to the cool one that's going to carry us through the next 45 minutes. What's... I mean, I hope not. <laughs> you know, what's so weird about this particular situation is that for the longest time, it was Ben Affleck talking about, I don't want to be Batman. Uh, people were concerned that he was just going to quit. He already quit Matt Reeves' Batman movie, which is going to be amazing. I and can't wait. I don't care who plays Batman. It's going to be great no matter who's in it. Uh, and then out of nowhere, Henry Cavill quit being <laughs> Superman. <laughs> Makes no sense. There was no hint of this at all. No. I, guess I think the, it makes sense. It's just a surprise. Well, like so, there are a lot of factors that I guess played into it. So reports were coming out that Henry Cavill was in negotiations with Warner Brothers on how much basically he should get paid for a Shazam cameo, and nobody could agree on what was fair. So he just said, "Well, I don't want to do it." And so, well, you have to. You can't fucking breach contract. And he's like, "Well, what if there was no contract, bitch?" And that's sort of how that's been going down. And also, while well, Warner Brothers has been fighting that fight. They also have been thinking about changing directions anyway because pretty much any movie with Henry Cavill Superman in it has not done well, mm -hmm. critically at least. Yeah. And so they're thinking about getting a Supergirl and running with that instead. Mm -hmm. So if they're, in their mind, a cinematic Supergirl is the way of the future and Henry Cavill's being a dick about pay, well, why do we even really need him? And Henry Cavill's like, well, I don't really need you either. I was just a Mission Impossible. I have the most expensive mustache in history, so I could quit if I want. Yeah. So it was. It seemed like it was a pretty um, an amicable split in the sense that... Mutual at the very least. Yeah, mutual that they wanted... They, neither one of them wanted anything to do with the other. And because that happened, <laughs> Ben Affleck's like, wait, you could just do that? So he fucking quit too. Yeah. <laughs> I... So... Flashback about a year and a half, I would have been upset to see Henry Cavill go, because he was like one of the only things that like. I don't think there's I don't anything blame, wrong with his Superman. I, I don't blame that. him for the direction they took Superman. Yeah. I blame them for the direction that they took Superman. It's like he can only show up and get directed. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, he and, he is a great looking Superman. His absolutely. acting is fine. Absolutely. I'm, I have no problem with him at all. Absolutely. Yeah. But. So what, so the thing that worries me about this whole thing is I'm not sad to see him go. I'm more excited any actually than I am sad to see because him now movies. he's going to get to do more movies like yeah. fucking Mission Impossible Fallout. Yeah, and we need that. But um, I'm worried about the whole eyeing Michael B. Jordan thing. I have no problem at all with yeah. Michael B. Jordan. He's not Superman at all. And it's well, not a color thing at all. No, no. Katie May and I had this conversation. It's, he just, Superman is supposed to have this sort of earnestness. Yes. And like, like hope, right? That's the Michael B. Jordan picture. is at his best when he's a badass. He mouths kill, off. Kill him, mofo. And he's just kicking ass and taking names. That is not Superman. Yeah. That would be like the uh, John Stewart, the Green Lantern. Or yeah. even a really badass version of Steel. How cool would that be? You yeah. have Supergirl as your main Kryptonian in the, in the universe. Yeah. And Steel as like a War Machine-esque side character. Yeah. Played by fucking Michael B. Jordan. Michael that's B. Jordan. awesome. Yeah, he's a stone-cold badass, but that's just not right for Superman. No, not at all. Not and really. it's like, a lot of people are like, this is one of those rare occasions where people are upset that that might be where they're going. And everyone's wrong for being mad at them for being upset. Because no one is saying it's like he wouldn't do a good job. It's just he's not the kind of... You know what I mean? It's a sort of wasted potential. Exactly. In the sense that he has the potential to play the shit out of a lot of characters. Yeah. But I don't think he throwing can play him the just shit out of that Throwing character. him at Superman because he's hot right now is not the way it's to go. It's a waste go. of what you could really use yes. him for. And also, let's maybe do Superman right in the normal, traditional sense before you start shaking it up and changing the game. Well, they already tried to do that with Man of Steel and people didn't like and it. That was <laughs> not anything like what... What if... Michael B. Jordan surprises us all and crushes it. I mean, that's cool. the thing is, I would probably enjoy it. it he's proven that good. he has a lot of range. Yeah, but, but what if he just like comes out of nowhere and he's like, "What? I'm Superman." I totally believe it. Comic book. Cool. If he plays Superman, how many comic book characters is that for him? That would be three, right? That would be his third one, probably. Yeah. Still hasn't yeah. beat Chris Evans. That dude's played, I think, five different comic book characters. Well, let's go through. Uh, well, he was in Snowpiercer. He was in The Losers. He's Captain America, obviously. He's the Human Torch, and there's one that I'm forgetting. Scott Pilgrim. That's right. That's the fifth one. Yep. Yeah. Yep. There you go. Oh, it's Michael B. Jordan. 
He was the human Killmon- torch. Killmonger, and he was Killmonger. Killmonger. Oh, he was oh, the human, human torch. torch. I yeah. forgot that one. Yeah, yeah that's everyone, one. everyone did. He everyone wishes, did. He wishes everyone. Would. I don't even think I saw that. What movie. does What does Michael B. Jordan and Chris Evans have in common? The human torch. Flame on, bro. Anyway. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's where I've, I am with that. I hope they just make some smart decisions for once. Cause I, it sounds like this, the whole uh, Warner Brothers cinematic universe is imploding. Yeah, oh yeah. And they just don't know where it's going to go. But you know what? Because it's imploding the way that it is, we're getting, they're, they're finally getting away from just making Batman Superman movies and they're making Aquaman yeah. and Wonder Woman. Yeah. And what's the next one that's coming out? Shazam. Shazam. Those all look okay. I mean, Wonder Woman was great. Mm-hmm. Uh, we all love Wonder Woman. Mm-hmm. Aquaman looks like I won't be bored, but it also looks cheesy and lame. And I'm CGI not and CGI suit. Yeah, I'm not super excited about it. But but if they I do am, that well, you need that in your superhero universe. Yeah, but I am super excited for Shazam. Oh, me too. So you know what? Maybe it's okay. Maybe this might be what we need. Basically, this is all an atomic bomb just blow up. It's already there. And what's coming out of the remnants are really good stuff. Maybe you know five, six, seven, maybe even ten years down the line, they may keep making a bunch of these other little side characters. They have enough to finally do a fucking Justice League movie the right way. Yes, please. Yeah. So maybe they'll just you know what? Don't try and rebuild. Just keep going with what you got. Yeah. Drop all this other bullshit. Get rid of the Flash. By the way, I don't like him. Oh yeah, he's real. Oh god, please. <laughs> yeah. Never. I don't. Oh man. And that entire. Besides Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman, that entire cast. Could go and I wouldn't care. Yeah, that's what I said. Like Gal Gadot is great. I mean, I'm sure someone else. There are plenty of people that could play play Wonder Woman really well. But Gal Gadot. Well, they're, not, they're already making another Wonder Woman. I know, Woman. and Gal Gadot's yeah. doing great. So you don't need to get rid of her. But like everybody else. Yeah. Who do you want to? So if you could pick someone just to have a little fun, because we're to wrap, play who? We're wrapping up kind of early. Uh, well, I have one more thing to go over after this. Who would you pick to play Batman and Superman now in a traditional sense? Not trying to uh, shake it up, just uh, traditional. Someone was floating the theory that John Hamm might be the next Batman. I like that and a lot. Yeah, I like that. Just me loving John Hamm unconditionally makes me biased. But me enjoying John Hamm enough and liking Batman is exciting. That's, oh, Henry Cavill is going to play Geralt of Rivia in a Witcher TV series. Put him, series. Put None of that. Funny if... Man, anything to you guys. Yeah, nothing but for me. all the video game nerds out there, that's huge because we wanted a Witcher thing for a long time, and Geralt, uh, Henry Cavill is a great choice to play the main character. It's great. Now, back to Katie Mae before she was interrupted. Yep. What if Henry Cavill was like, I want to play Superman, but I want to be Batman. That'd be hilarious. <laughs> There's no possible way that could happen, but that would be hilarious if they cast him as yeah. Batman. <laughs> Someone brought also floated an idea that I saw online that would be really cool. Just like a little like small post. It wasn't anything crazy. But what if they got Michael Keaton to play old Batman and they did Batman Beyond? Oh. That'd be so cool. Yeah. That'd, that'd be, be an dope. amazing movie. Who would you have play Terry McGinnis? Uh, Michael B. Jordan? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe not. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, for Batman and Superman right now, I think John Hamm is a good choice, but when it comes to Superman, I don't know, Henry Cavill was kind of an unknown when he was cast, mm. and I think that might be the way to go. Or The kid pull, who plays White Boy Rick. Yeah, the kid who plays White Boy Rick. Let's bring him in as Superman. <laughs> With the tweedly little per- <laughs> head stash. Yeah, I love it. Dude, I love his poor I'd also take uh, Army Hammer as Superman. I think that'd be fun. No. No way. Sorry. That's all right. I, I can't align with you on that okay. at all. Right. I don't really like Army Hammer all that much. I don't love him either, but that, I mean, he's... He's he's okay. He's boy, um, he's boy scouty enough to play Superman. Um, but... Wow, man, what was it? I lost it before you brought up Army Hammer. Oh, I would love to see Brandon Routh come back and be Superman. He was a great Superman. Mm-hmm. He was a great Superman, he, uh, Christopher Reeves Superman. Yeah. I want that back. Yeah. Good stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I really don't know. I, I don't know. I could go through a million actors and find a bunch of people who could probably. You know what? It would be interesting. James Franco Superman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who would be down for that? Who would watch that movie? James Franco Superman. Seth Rogen Batman. Yes! <laughs> That's the best movie ever! <laughs> um, Dave Franco. No! Dave Franco plays Superboy. Yeah. <laughs> Jonah Hill is Robin. That's oh man, this be, no Jay Baruchel is is uh, Robin. Jonah Hill plays Alfred. Dude, I think uh, this is a fucking great movie. <laughs> Hold on, go. why can't they make that movie? <laughs> they should just let them make it. Just give them a call. <laughs> yeah, just let me call I'll them, them up. up really. I'll ring them up when we're done recording. Yeah. 
They should remake Batman vs. Superman <laughs> from from total scratch. Just use that script. Jonah Hill plays Lex Luthor, <laughs> but bald. <laughs> oh, that's a good. That's another good thing about losing Superman and Bat or Superman and Batman. No, we so don't we have to endure Jesse Eisenberg. Yeah, we don't ever have. Luthor. Well, we shouldn't ever have to see the payoff of uh, what's his face is Deathstroke and Jesse Eisenberg, Lex Luthor. Such weird casting from top to bottom. I think Superman should be Peter from Deadpool. <laughs> yeah, I watched that movie too. <laughs> funny if he got in like crazy good shape to do it too. Yeah. He probably would. Who wouldn't? Anyway, what else did you have to cover before we wrap up? Uh, well, we didn't do a classic movie thing because you guys didn't see it. But I do want to talk a little bit about something that's totally off topic completely. And I saw, um, I was shown a Wes Anderson movie I had never seen. And we're talking a lot about movies that are like polarizing and that movies, uh, movies that people don't really like. But he showed me uh, the Daging Limited. Who showed you? Kiabash. When oh. he was here. So we saw The Nun, and then uh, the next day, Katie Mary was at work. And he's like, hey, have you seen this movie? And I'm a, I'm a big Wes Anderson fan. I've seen a lot of his movies, but I hadn't even heard of this movie. I haven't either. And, and I was like, no, what is that? And he, he put it on, and it's the weirdest movie. But it's excellent. So the reason I, I'm putting it here instead of like a classic movies um, situation is just because it's... Interesting to talk about, where I, I have sort of been developing a running theory about some movies. I love a movie with a tight script. Like, I'll talk about Taken all the time as having one of the tightest yeah. scripts that I've seen. And I love it when a movie just, like, gets down to it, doesn't mess around too much. This is a movie that does nothing but mess around, yet I love it. Um, and the, my theory is that some of the best movies are the ones that excel in the little moments. Mm -hmm. uh, one parallel that I can draw this to, and I'll tell you more about The Daisy Unlimited in a minute but is Rocky. If you were to boil the, the plot of the first Rocky and even a movie that I would say is better than the first Rocky, and that's Rocky Balboa, the one that's directed by Sylvester Stallone himself, mm -hmm. if you boil those, those plots down to its actual story, the whole movie would be like 30 minutes, maybe 25. And what's, what's the other hour taken up by? The little moments. Him interacting with other characters, interacting with or trying to, you know, get Adrian to be his girlfriend and go on a date with him. And you learn about the characters and you get to see how much the people in the town love him and respect him. And all of that stuff has nothing to do with the story at hand, but it's so entertaining to watch. You can't take your eyes off of it. And it's inspiring. And when you finish the movie, you're like, I don't even care about this fucking fight. When you get to the fight in Rocky Balboa, you're like, I don't care. I had so much fun along the way, it doesn't matter what happens, right? I sort of felt the same way about this movie. It's an old Wes Anderson movie from like 2007. And it stars um, Owen Wilson, Jason Schwartzman, and Adrian Brody as three sort of estranged brothers. So, and Wes Anderson's, like, MVPs. Yes, but this was, yeah. like, before, this was what made them MVPs, yeah. right? But the reason I wanted to talk about this movie at all is that it, it, it's pretty, it's reviewed pretty horribly. Uh, it has, like, a 67% on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, let me see, let me pull up all of the stats on it real quick while my computer unfreezes. But it takes these three estranged brothers... And they, right after their father's death, and they're taking a train to go see their mother, except Owen Wilson didn't tell them that that's where they're going. Uh -huh. And the whole movie is just their journey there, and all kinds of ridiculous random shit happens to them, but that's the whole plot of the movie. If you just took the, the basically the whole story is them being on this train. If you showed like five minutes of them being on the train, and then them getting to see their mom, you would understand the plot of the story. That's like 15 minutes. What happens along the way, all these little bits where you just get to learn about each one of these characters very intimately and, and have a good time with them, makes it a ton of fun. So here's some bits, though, from Rotten Tomatoes. A Wes Anderson film is like a snow globe. It's hermetically sealed, precious, and pointless. Uh, <laughs> it's, hold on, what's this one? For all of Anderson's pleasing, refreshing, Artur te um, tenacities, the overwhelming feeling delivered from the Daisy Limited is a frustration, deja vu, and very little progression. It's Darjeeling Limited. Darjeeling? Sure, that's fine. So, <laughs> people don't like this movie because... It's it, meandering. It, meandering, it doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. But I think I've been readapting my feeling that a movie should just cut the chuff on and get straight to it. That sometimes these little moments help a lot. The thing is that some people don't know how to use them well. Sylvester Stallone is an expert at using those moments. Mm -hmm. Maybe he doesn't even know that he is, because <laughs> a 
A lot of people have the running theory that this guy is just an idiot, but he has proven more than once that he's really good at those little moments, and so is Wes Anderson. Yeah. Because his other movies have these two. Like, what do you remember about the Grand Budapest Hotel? Oh, just the camaraderie between uh, Ralph Fiennes and the, the, yeah. the bell, and what's that kid's name? The bellboy. Yeah, Zero. Yeah. But you don't really remember that it's about a painting thief or yeah. a theft of a painting yeah. and all that other you stuff. You just right? remember goofy bits and the, the just character that the whole thing had. Exactly. It, it's, um, so it's, they go through, they're on this train, then they get kicked off the train, and then they save these little boys from dying, but one of them passes away, and they go to the funeral, and, and it's all this really interesting stuff. Um, I think that this movie gets overlooked a lot in the sense that I had no clue it existed. You just learned that it existed. I'm, and I consider myself a pretty big fan of his. Me too. And for me to have completely overlooked this movie, I don't know how I missed it, but I think that... In the sense, in, we didn't cover a classic movie this week, but if if uh, anyone is a Wes Anderson fan and has overlooked this movie, jump on it because it's a lot of fun. But yeah. not for the story, for the moments. For the moments. Well, in the end, if you go to see a movie to have a good time, and if you have a good time just watching people be themselves in interesting ways and in interesting situations, but it's not tell like it's not giving you a moral or anything like yeah. that. That's fine. The That's thing just... is, though, like, what's great is that the story itself almost is irrelevant, but the characters, each one of them, they do have growth. Mm-hmm. And he was very smart about planting these little seeds, and when they come full circle, for example, uh, Jason Schwartzman is, a, is an author in the, in the movie. Mm-hmm. And at the beginning, he would write a little segment of a story, he would give it to one of his brothers, and go, what do you think of this? And they would read it, and he'd go, oh, I like it, so this is like me, and this is like this person. Like, no, all these characters are fictional. And very, very firm on, like, these are all made up situations. I'm not expressing myself, mm-hmm. motherfucker. This is all fabricated. Then at the end of the movie, the same thing happens. He writes a little bit of a story, gives it to his brother, and, and they say, oh, so this is like this person, this is like this person. Like, ah. Yep, it is. And very small, but you can tell the events of the movie allowed him to be comfortable expressing himself to his brothers. Yeah. Those are the little things that make this movie excellent when it comes to him being a director. Maybe not a strong script, but deserves a rewatch. Mm. Well, I'm definitely sold. I want to see it. Do it. Okay. Anyway, uh, that's all the movie news. We did the reviews up top. If anyone listens to this and is wonders about the order or structure of things, I think you should let us know if you enjoyed having the reviews at the beginning versus having them at the end. If also, you don't F off. It. It's our show. We'll do what we want. True. But also, if you don't care about any of that, just, just put it in the comments. I don't care about any of that. Great. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so okay, okay. We belong to an entity called Screenplay. Tyler, what's Screenplay? How can people find it? Screenplay can be found on Facebook and all other forms of social media, but Facebook's the most important at S Vertical P. That is the letter S, the word vertical, the letter P. Um, you can find us on YouTube too at S Vertical P and Patreon. Uh, come out and support us. We just released the first episode of an ongoing. Uh, monthly Patreon exclusive commentary series called Four Dollar Fridays. Uh, this last one we did was the Bucket List. We had our friend Sarah on. It was really good. It was dope. Yeah. Not only because the movie was dope and we didn't think it would be, but it was fun. It was a good time, and there's a lot of good conversation. And Sarah's really funny, so come check it out. Uh, thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. Can you make anything? You look like something's on the tip of your tongue. Spit it out. <laughs> <laughs>